Okay, we're rolling. All right, this is an interview at the New York State Military Museum, Saratoga Springs, New York. It is the 12th of April, 2006, approximately 10:15 a.m. Interviewers are Wayne Clark and Mike Russert. Could you give me your full name, date of birth, and place of birth, please? Hi, my name is John Mole. Uh, I was born in Scotia, and uh, most people know me by the name of Bud. Most <laughs> kids I go through to school with, uh, if I asked them what my name was, they'd say, well, Bud, well, who's John? I don't know. <laughs> but uh, When were you born, sir? I was born in 1924, October 17th. Okay. Um, what was your educational background prior to entering service? Well, I was... I can't say I really graduated from high school. I was about three months before graduation when uh, a whole group was going that was being drafted of most of my friends, and I wanted to go with them, so I went over and volunteered for induction. And uh, they said, well, you're automatically deferred until you graduate. And I said, yeah, I know, but I want to go. So they, they were eager to fill their quota, so I, I went and I, I received a diploma anyway while I was gone, but I, by the time graduation come around, I was just completing basic training. Mm -hmm. uh, Do you remember where you were when you heard about Pearl Harbor? I can remember that very vividly. <laughs> I was laying on the living room floor reading the Sunday comics when Dad happened to turn the radio on and we heard something about Pearl Harbor. and. Where's Pearl Harbor right now? Mm -hmm. I was not familiar with where it was or what it was. Most, most people weren't. And uh, it was only through the news and whatnot that followed that we found out that it was a primary naval base in the Pacific. And, but up to that time, I had no concept of the. How did you feel when you heard about this? Did your family talk about this at yes, all? Yes, uh, that's about the time my dad said, uh, well, my brother was about a year and a half older than I. And uh, he said, you'll probably get in it. But then he turned to me and he says, you won't. You're 17. It'll be all over before you get in. Well, <laughs> Dad was wrong on that account. And my sister, my brother, and I all served in, uh, in the service during the war. My sister lost her husband. My brother was seriously wounded, shattered left arm. And outside of a few minor scrapes and wounds, I. I came out of it pretty much on scat. No, your brother was in the army also. Yes, he was. Yeah. Your sister? Yes, she was a sergeant in the uh, uh, air force. Well, it was the army air force, but oh, she okay. was assigned to the air force. I was very fortunate that I happened to meet her in London. I had quite a time locating her in London, and we had quite a reunion over there, and right just after Christmas in 1944. And needless to say, we we had quite a tearful reunion over there. And then shortly after that is when uh, Red Cross contacted me and uh, said that my brother had been seriously wounded and he had been brought back to England in a hospital. And I was able to get a pass and go up and visit him in a field hospital before they shipped him home for further surgery. Mm -hmm. And then after the war, I was able, when the war ended in Europe, I. I had to go up to Paris with a group of uh, men to pick up trucks and bring them back down to Marseille where we were stationed at that time. And while I was in Paris, I was able to locate my sister there again and, and we had a, quite a reunion there. And uh, that was just before we were to ship out of Marseille directly to the Pacific for the invasion of Japan. Mm -hmm. Okay, where did you go for your basic training? I was down at Camp Walters, Texas, and uh, that was a, what they called an IRTC, an Infantry Replacement Training Center, and we, we were trained in uh, heavy weapons, infantry heavy weapons platoon, which dealt with 81 millimeter mortars and 30 caliber water-cooled machine guns. And at that time, they were giving a 13-week basic training, and you went right overseas to replacement for units that had casualties in combat. Mm -hmm. But uh, right at the end of the basic, when they were getting ready to start shipping people out, they decided they'd change their tactics and let 
let you go home for, uh, well, you had five days plus traveling time to be able to go home at least once before you went overseas. Mm -hmm. But uh, I was not fortunate enough at, at that time to get a pass because I'd been pulled out to be sent to the Army Specialized Training Program, they called it then, the ASTP. And they sent me up to Texas A&M College for some refresher courses and from there I went to Illinois Institute of Technology in Chicago and I spent a semester up there and that was quite a quite an experience for a small time boy to be dumped in the middle of downtown Chicago mm -hmm. uh, uh, but uh, I spent a semester there and then the Army decided to cut back on the program and only continue with the top 10% of the class. And needless to say, I was not in that top 10. Now, so, what kind of specialized training did you receive? Well, that, they were, uh, it was like engineering and uh, pretty much like civil engineering. And, and uh, they were figuring on probably a, a much longer war and that they were going to need more technically trained people. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's why I had taken a course similar to that in high school, so I guess that kind of qualified me for that program. But uh, then I got sent back, to, right back to Camp Walters again, and as a replacement. And then from there I got sent to Little Rock, Arkansas, to Camp Robinson, Arkansas, for the combat engineers. Up to that time I never knew what a combat engineer was. But that was my first introduction to the combat engineers with the 259th Engineer Combat Battalion. And it's funny, I was only there a short time. I was, the first month I was there I made PFC, the second month corporal, and the third month I was made sergeant. And uh, then shortly after that they decided they was going to form the 1285th Engineer Combat Battalion and they needed a cadre. So there was a group of officers and enlisted men from the 259th that were being sent to Camp Housey, Texas to activate the 1285th Engineers. And that's where I spent the rest of the time in, in the service during World War II was with that 1285th Engineer. Company. Let me ask you something. What was your training like as a combat engineer? Did you learn to operate heavy equipment or ex use well, explosives? Well, to an extent or? we did. We did a lot with explosives. I eventually became an explosives and demolition uh, specialist. Mm -hmm. And in uh, a later uh, period of, of uh, enlistment, I was at Fort Benning, Georgia, and I taught uh, explosives and demolitions to, uh, at the uh, infantry school at Fort Benning. But uh, basically it was uh, like road construction, road maintenance, and, uh, and uh, Boeing, uh, tank traps, uh, tank craters. Uh, it was a mixture of engineering and, and demolition. And, but we didn't really get into much into bridge building until just prior to going overseas. The unit went up to a, a pond up in our, just outside of Ardmore, Oklahoma, Lake Murray, and that was our first introduction with floating uh, foot bridges and uh, rafts for uh, rafting over tanks and heavy trucks and so on. And that was our training before we sailed for for England. And that. Once we got to England is where we were introduced to the Bailey Bridge, which was a marvel of engineering. That was just, it went together like a huge erector set. And uh, it, it was just fabulous. Uh, they had fixed ones that were put over dry chasms or over small creeks. And there was also the floating type that were put on uh, pontoons, either the rubber pontoons or in our case, most of it was with the uh, plywood wooden pontoons. Now what made it so spectacular? Well it was quick to go up. Once you uh, got the knack of what you were doing, uh, the panels each weighed over 600 pounds and they had carrying bars, oh maybe about four feet long, 
with a metal ring in the center and you got six people, three on each side, and you'd cry out, lay hold, heave, and then everybody would pick it up and you'd walk it up. And it went together like two pieces would go in like this and then a pin would be put through and then a safety pin. Mm -hmm. And you just, you kept, like on a fixed bridge, you would build it and it would be on rollers near the edge of the bank and you'd build it on dry land and push it out. And then you need lead just enough on the shore side to counterbalance what was hanging over. And you just push it out, build some more counterbalance, push it more until it reached the other side, and then you dismantle the counterbalance and you had uh, a fixed belly bridge. You see quite a few of those every now and then here in this country today when they're uh, repairing bridges or rebuilding, they'll put in a temporary bridge mm -hmm. on the side, and most of them are all. Bailey bridges, and they and they they call them double double, or single double, or triple triple, depending on how many panels you could put them. Three wide, two or three high, and the more you put, the more weight they would hold. Uh, like the floating bridges we built across the Rhine, uh, they would take a, a 40 ton Sherman tank, and at 50 foot intervals, you could put 25 of them on as long as they kept 50 foot intervals going across the river. And it was really a, a remarkable, it was a British invention and mm -hmm. uh, it, it was fantastic. We put up four of them across the Rhine River uh, and <laughs> we lost a good bit of one of our bridges when uh, they either cut loose or uh, the barge upstream broke loose and drifted down. Now this was in the spring of the year, just well, matter of weeks before the war actually ended over there and the Rhine River was in flood stage and there was a lot of debris coming down. Well, this barge came down and wiped out a good bit of the bridge that had to be replaced. So the next day they said, well, we can't have this going on. So they sent reconnaissance parties up either side of the river all the way to Cologne with orders to sink anything that would float. And it was a shame to see some of the, the boats and, and barges and houseboats and whatever. People were living on to them. We gave them 10 minutes to get their stuff off and then we'd blow the bottoms off and sink them. And we had no choice because they could keep sending things down and destroying our bridges and we had to keep the supply lines open. But it was quite an experience. Now what's the longest one that you built? Well, the first one we built was from Rheinhausen to Duisburg in Germany, and at that time it was the longest floating Bailey Bridge over moving water that had ever been built, and it was 1,534 feet long. How long did it take yeah, to build it? Well, uh, we were doing real well until we ran out of panel pins. Uh, somebody in the <laughs> supply section just didn't get enough panel pins, and they had to fly some back over from England. but. To, in actually construction time, it probably took us a little over two and a half days, which isn't bad for a 40-ton bridge like that. Yeah. But, uh, we, we became quite proficient at it, and uh, after we'd gotten that built, uh, another uh, engineer battalion was assigned to build one at Cologne, and they had no familiarization with the bridge at all. They had never done it before. And as we were sent up to give them a hand, we wound up building it and using them for the manpower to build it. And uh, we built four of them while we were there. And uh, for some reason or other, the very first one we built, they named it the Jerome Bridge after the commanding general of the 15th Army. But for some reason or other, he didn't like that. And so a day or two later, that was named a Triumph Bridge. And uh, I don't know where the signs came from because we had no sign makers or anything in our unit. We would build the bridge and then we'd go on to the next spot. But if we came back by a day or two later, here's these huge signs up here. <laughs> uh, with our giving credit to the 1285th engineers and so on. And uh, it was quite surprising. Were there many injuries uh, putting these bridges together? We had a few and uh, we were quite fortunate because it, it was delicate. Each, uh, each section of that bridge had to be anchored 
on the upstream sides with cables to keep the bridge. They would have these little power boats and we'd take a, um, an anchor upstream and drop it and then come back and we'd have to pull the bridge in alignment to keep it straight and the anchors were all the way across. You had to have those in there and uh, we usually had men stationed about every third or fourth panel. They were stationed on the upstream side of the pontoon and they had to shoot and hit anything floating in the water at least once. They had to keep shooting until they hit it because they were floating mines down mm -hmm. and whatnot. So, uh, and then of course we were getting some enemy fire come in and we'd get some uh, uh, mortar shells coming in and so on and, and uh, we'd have to do some damage if a pontoon got damaged uh, we'd have to try to replace it. And, uh, but uh, basically, we lost a few on our uh, reconnaissance. We lost some when we were going up on either side of the river to, uh, to sink the boats and barges when uh, they ran over mines and uh, anti-personnel mines, anti-tank mines, and we lost a couple that way. But. Uh, it's amazing how something like that could take a 40-ton tank. Without a bridge that you could put up that quickly could take mm -hmm. a 40-ton tank. And, uh, we received quite a commendation from the commanding general uh, for having built them and having done it in, in uh, a record time. But uh, I think the closest I came personally to, to getting killed over there was by our own troops. Uh, that's a story that goes with that. Uh, they were considering building another bridge at Mannheim and uh, they wanted a far shore reconnaissance. Now, they have two types of patrols. You have a combat patrol and you have a reconnaissance patrol. And whichever one you're going on, you go armed to the teeth. Mm -hmm. Now, what kind of weapons did you carry? Well, at that time we carried the M1 rifle, and uh, uh, well, at the time that we went, the lieutenant that was with us, there was a lieutenant, a corporal, and myself, and uh, the lieutenant was armed with a uh, 30 caliber carbine, and the corporal and myself were both armed with the M1 Garand, and we had uh, more than our share of grenades and extra bandoliers of, of ammunition. Uh, in a combat patrol, you go out looking for a fight, but when you go on a reconnaissance patrol, the idea is you're armed, but mainly to fight your way out because if necessary, you try to dodge a fight because if you don't get back with the information they want, it's no good to anybody. So uh, I, I don't know why usually it's just enlisted men that were sent on these uh, reconnaissance, but the lieutenant came to me and he said, Sergeant, pick a corporal to go with us. The three of us have to make a far shore recon. Well, he says, I had gone up to a division and they said that Mannheim was pretty much cleared so that we could go over, but uh, to stay within the city limits because beyond that it was not clear yet of Germany. So we, the only transportation or boat that we could get was a nose section of one of our uh, pontoon boats. Uh, the, the floats, the pontoons came in three sections. The middle section was just a rectangular uh, plywood boat. And the nose section had a slight upswing as did the, the, the downstream section. They went together like piano hinges. They went together with a long pin that went down to it that locked it all together. So we just took the nose section, one of those, grabbed some paddles and that, and put the put it on a jeep, and we went on down to the river. Well, at that time, the 82nd Airborne, which had been relieved at Bastogne from the Battle of the Bulge, and uh, they had been brought down there, and they were put in defensive positions along the, the banks of the Rhine. and. Uh, when we got down there, they said, well, if you're going over, make sure when you come back, you get back before dark, because after dark, we shoot everything that's on the river. So, and we said, okay. So we, 
at the time we started to put the boat in, I noticed a, an M1 ran a grand rifle laying half in and half out of the water. And uh, it had a leather sling onto it. And boy, I wanted a leather sling the worst way because we had the web belt slings and they would wad up and they'd cut your shoulder after a while. And the leather slings, oh, I wanted that. I didn't have time to take it off. Things were getting pretty hot and heavy. So I just tossed it in the trailer behind the Jeep. And we paddled over across the river, and you figure it, that's quite a, quite a good-sized river, the Rhine River. And we got across, and we pulled the boat up into the bushes and climbed up the bank and started in towards the center of Mannheim. And about the time we were getting to the outskirts, all of a sudden all these people came rushing out with us and screaming and crying and hugging us and kidding. what the heck is going on? We're, like, we're their liberators. Uh, this is supposed to have been already liberated. Well, come to find out the city was not completely liberated. There were a lot of Germans left in there. And we hadn't hardly gotten into there when I, I saw one of these uh, L5 spotter plane that they used for the artillery and that. Mm -hmm. uh, he was being shot at, but I, I could see the flock, flak burst all around it, and he was trying to dodge. And it wasn't far from where I was. I looked around the corner of this building, and here's this 88 millimeter uh, German anti-tank. Well, that 88 artillery piece was a very versatile piece, mm -hmm. one of the best artillery pieces of the war. It was a fantastic weapon. They could use it as an artillery. They could use it as an anti-aircraft. I've even seen it lay it right down and fire it flat trajectory to a tank. And it, uh, it was just amazing. And here was this gun pit, and there was four or five Germans in there. And, uh, and I was only about 30 yards from them. And I took one grenade. I pulled the pin, and I was just about ready to toss it in there when a the lieutenant grabbed me by the collar. He said, Come on, we got to get out of here. If you throw that, he says, they're liable to come flying out of the buildings. And he said, we... So I reluctantly, I felt sorry. I don't know if they ever did shoot down that L5, but uh, reluctantly I managed to get the pin back in the grenade and we got out of there. And these displaced persons, they were from the occupied countries where they'd been brought in as slave laborers mm -hmm. to work in the farms and the factories and so on. Well, they proceeded to, uh, to lead us on a very, what they considered it was an elderly woman there that spoke some broken English. She was able to convince us to follow them because they knew how, the way to get where they was safe. And uh, they, they hit us out in, in the cellar of some bomb buildings there and they got us some wine and some bread and not being able to understand them, we had kind of asked them to test the wine <laughs> first before we would try any of it. But we finally, they, we convinced them what we were there for, and they led us down to the river where we were able, what we were looking for was good egress routes away from the bridge that had been built where there were, were no obstructions, where traffic mm -hmm. could flow quite freely. Because in a lot of those German cities and that, they had a lot of little archways uh, going in and out. They were not much wider than a jeep. And so uh, we were able to find a good access route out of there where there was only some minimal uh, tank traps and that that could be easily <coughs> removed with explosives and that. So we got the information we were after, but they, we were convinced by the displaced people there to not to try it during daylight, you know, that, that, that it was too dangerous. So they, they had us out for a couple of days, moving us from time to time from one cellar to another. And finally they, they said, come on, and they led us in a rather securious route around, but they got us back to about where we had met them originally. And, and we found our way back down to the to the river, but it was dark. And we hemmed and hawed as to whether we should try going back over in the dark after the warning that we'd been given, or whether we should stay there and risk being find, found by a German patrol, because that would be 
just as bad getting caught and either captured or killed and the information would, would not get back. Mm -hmm. And so we decided that well we would we would take our chance and be quiet and try to get back across the river. Well as we put our things in the in the boat and lifted it up and tried it. Now they're quite heavy. Now three of us were carrying it down to put in the water when one of them stumbled, I don't know who, and it dropped and it landed on some rocks along the shore. Well, it was just like somebody beating on the bass drum. And so we stopped and we waited a minute and sure enough, pop, we heard it and up goes a parachute flare from the far shore. And those things just light up like broad daylight. And we just froze and stood and didn't move a muscle. And it took a little while for it to float down and burn out. But we waited and we said, well, maybe we're not. Well, maybe we hadn't better go. And then out goes another one. Well, they kept doing that. And we had it pretty well timed to wear about 20 minute intervals. So we said, okay, we'll take a chance. The minute this next one burns out, We'll throw it in and paddle like hell. We can get back before the, within 20 minutes, we can get back over. Well, this is what we did, and we got out in midstream and they followed us up because they fired another one and caught us in midstream. And boy, they started shooting. And the lieutenant standing up screaming, yelling, waving his arms, don't shoot. And you could see the machine gun bullets coming in the water straight towards us, and a couple of them came through the boat in one side, not the other, luckily above the water line, and didn't hit anybody, but he finally got through to them, and they ceased fire. And we, we got back in one piece, luckily, and the lieutenant got a, quite a chewing out by a, a, a captain from the Airborne for having come back after dark, after having been warned, but uh, at least we got back and we're in, the one, in one piece. When we got back to the unit, we found out that they'd already sent out missing in action, had forwarded on up the battalion and, uh, and so on. So the lieutenant was able to get up to division and, and, and stop the, that process, so our families were never notified of our missing in action. But uh, I guess the irony of the whole thing was that just a little while after that, the war ended and they decided not to build that bridge after all. Mm -hmm. oh. <laughs> But that was about as close as I came, and I, I had a couple other instances while on recon patrols where I had stepped on a couple of these bouncing Bettys. Uh, that's what we called it. it, was a German S mine, anti-personnel mine. Mm -hmm. And what it was, was um, it was just a little canister that was buried in the ground. It had three little prongs that stuck just above the ground level. And if you stepped on any one of those, it was like a little pop. And, and this canister would shoot up about six feet in the air and then detonate. And it had about 360 steel ball bearings into it that were just spread shrapnel in all directions. I stepped on one and I heard it pop and it never come out of the ground. And about 20 minutes later I stepped on another one that popped that came up and didn't detonate. It just came up and then fell. And I thought, oh my. God, somebody up there is looking over my shoulder. I don't know, <laughs> but uh, we had so many people injured and killed with, with those type mines that uh, to step on two of them in one day, and, and it was just made a believer out of you, you know, because it, you hear the old expression, there's no atheist in a foxhole. Uh, <laughs> I can vouch for that. I can vouch for that. You said on your form you had a slight scalp wound? Yes, uh, some shrapnel from an incoming uh, uh, mortar round apparently ricocheted off of something and it caught me just, just above the hairline up in, in the hair. And of course head wounds like that, they look a lot worse than they are because they bleed quite mm -hmm. profusely. And the medic, he, he my God, sorry, he'd come over, he started cleaning it off, and he said, well, that isn't really that bad, he said, but, so he patched it up, and he said, I'll see you in another day or two, he says, and I'll, uh, look me up, and I'll change the bandage onto it. Uh, I didn't get around to see him, and it seemed to 
be all right. So after a couple of days, I just took it off, and I never did really lose any any time as far as I. You uh, never put in for a Purple Heart. Well, he, I don't know if he ever filed it. I knew that he was supposed to, but uh, uh, no, I, I I didn't know. I, I never put in for it. I don't think he ever ever did either, because. It, there was quite a few of those things. I mean, sometimes I, I see fellas get some pretty well banged up on their legs and that from barbed wire, and, uh, you know, and uh, need medication and, and bandages for that. But uh, now I was I was pretty fortunate in, in that. Uh, I the thing that did get me was I saw some really heroic acts that didn't go rewarded. And I saw some medals given to people who <clears throat> never got anywhere near where the fighting was. And that, that kind of uh, teed me off because I thought it would cheapen the medal. Mm -hmm. uh, as one officer one time over, I overheard him saying was, look, I can't write myself up for a medal, but he says, if you write me up for one, I'll write you up for one. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and, and I, I that, that kind of got to me because I, as I say, I saw some guys do some pretty heroic things and never received any recognition whatsoever. And uh, I what think. What do you? What did you mean when you said our company officers, with one exception, were excellent? Well, I. I have one officer. In fact, it was our company commander, and his picture is actually in that in that book. And I have his picture too, standing by one of our bridges. I, I did not respect him. He was the type that demanded respect instead of trying to earn it. Mm -hmm. And uh, but we had several other uh, lieutenants that were just fantastic. They were excellent officers. And. Uh, rather ironically, here just a few years ago, I. Was lo I was able to locate that captain that I had. Uh, he was retired. He had stayed in the Army, and he had retired as a major, and he was living over in New London, Connecticut. And uh, he never knew that there was a unit history out, and I had had several copies of him. So I sent one to him, and I never so much as got a thank you. Hmm. you know, uh, he was one of them that I just... I, I, I had little or no respect for it whatsoever, but uh, as a majority of them, I, we had some excellent officers, real excellent. And uh, one of the best we had was a sergeant who had received a battlefield commission. Uh, and of course, he, he spent more time with the enlisted men afterwards than he did with the officers. So. The men liked him, but the officers kind of looked down their nose at him. But, uh, but we had we had some excellent officers, and we had some that were not so excellent. Now, when the, where were you when the war ended? Uh, when the war ended, we were up in uh, Kempen, Germany. Uh, the first German town that we entered actually was Aachen when we got into there. And I can, I, I just, I can't to this day get out of my head how devastated that, that city of Aachen was. I don't think there was a chicken coop that wasn't riddled. The de destruction, it was just awesome. And it was tough to see these centuries old cities just laying in ruins and uh, uh, forests denuded of the trees, of streams filled with the debris and the rivers. The, blown bridges and I, it just it was awesome and all you could think is good lord it was better we're doing it here than home because mm -hmm. I and but uh, yeah we were we were up in in Aachen at the time and uh, not right right along near the Rhine River when we received word that the war had ended and we were given the task then of starting to repair the infrastructure over there, clearing roads and uh, using some of our heavy equipment to clean some of the... Uh, and uh, Mukengladbach was one of the cities 
we were clearing the streets uh, of the rubble and so on, and we figured, well, here we are, we're going to be here for the Army of Occupation. But uh, very shortly, it was only a matter of a few weeks after the war ended, and we, just, we were assigned these tasks of uh, cleaning up the debris, patching roads, fixing bridges, and so on, when we got orders to move down to southern Germany. And so we had to pack all up and we convoyed down into southern Germany. And from there they sent us on down to Arles in southern France, which is down in the French Riviera, not, not too far from uh, Marseille. And uh, we received training down there on destruction of uh, beach obstacles. And so it was quite obvious that we were uh, being groomed for the invasion of Japan. And uh, it was at that time when I uh, and the motor sergeant were in charge of a hundred men going up to Paris to bring back a hundred trucks to be transshipped to the Pacific. And that's when I got the uh, three-day pass to go see my sister. Uh, and we get back down into Arles, and we were still in our winter OD uniforms, and it's like going down to southern Florida in the middle of August. I, it was oh, 90, 95 degrees, humid, right on the Mediterranean. And our, our winter uniforms were all sweat-stroked, uh, soaked, and yeah. So, and needless to say, morale was at an all-time low. And the only high point was the one and only USO show we saw was Bob Hope came there and, uh, and put on a show for us because we were getting ready to leave for the Pacific. And as kind of a funny side story, uh, Betty Hutton was supposed to be with him now, she was quite popular at the time as an actress and a singer. And as she came by, of course, we were in the staff car, everybody's looking in the back seat and waving to her and whatnot. And it wasn't until sometime after the war that one of my best buddies from hometown was a guy that was driving that staff car. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but uh, they, put, they put on quite a show, and of course, I, I never figured Bob Hope ever got justly rewarded for all he did for the troops during World War II and even afterwards. But then uh, about the 15th, maybe a little earlier than that, in August, we were loaded, combat loaded, onto uh, a Liberty ship, the uh, USS Breckenridge, and we steamed out of Marseille, scheduled for 45 days out through the Mediterranean, through the Straits of Gibraltar, across the Atlantic, through the Panama Canal, and across to the Philippines. And they were already telling us that we were going to be in some of the first waves to go to shore in Japan, and our life expectancy under the conditions was under three minutes. So as I say, uh, we were going to be sent ashore to destroy the beach obstacles so the landing craft could come in. And uh, we were just coming out, we had just come through the Straits of Gibraltar into the Atlantic. It's a little tough to, to talk about, even this day, that we, uh, it came on the ship's loudspeaker, and I'll hear this. We've just received word. The war with Japan has ended. And we're now going to New York City. For a while there was absolute silence aboard that ship. And then pandemonium. It's just unbelievable. Unbelievable. Then all restrictions were lifted. You could be on deck after dark at night. It couldn't before because if you smoked up there, lighting our, our senior cigarettes would be a giveaway to submarines and so on. So the rest of that voyage turned into be almost like a cruise, a 
fact, a number of us grabbed our bed rolls and rolled them up on the deck and we slept up there at night in August. It was, it was just beautiful. And then, I think it was nine, nine days later, we came into New York in a drizzling rain. And as we came by the Statue of Liberty, everybody was on deck. Everybody was up there, and it wasn't a dry eye, and it wasn't from the rain. The fireboats were out there shooting their multiple streams of water in the air. Just about every ship in the harbor was blowing its horns and its whistles. There was these huge signs hanging off of buildings. Welcome home. Job well done. Sixty years back still. Yeah. But it was wonderful, and we were we were unloaded and taken to Fort Monmouth, where we were fed a, a fantastic steak dinner. We were some of the first troops to come back after the finish of the entire war, and uh, then we were sent to Fort Dix. Uh, most of us because were from New York State and that, and. We were given th 30 days leave, which later was extended for 15 more, so we had 45 days leave before we had to go back and rejoin our units. And by the time that was up and I rejoined the unit back at uh, for Camp Bowie, Texas at the time, um, a good majority of our personnel had already been discharged from the reception centers and that. So we were quite understaffed and undermanned, and I was promoted up another grade and, and assigned as first sergeant of C Company. And I don't know why, but somebody decided that we were going to be assigned to the strategic command and we were going to start new training periods. Well, so many of our men, and as well as myself, were so close to having the points to be discharged that it seemed rather ridiculous to go through this. So, but it was only a short time after that that they decided to deactivate the unit. And uh, that's when the CEO of the company called us in and he said, I know that over in Europe we picked up a lot of excess weapons that we were beyond our TO and E. Uh, table of organization and equipment, we, we had picked up extra VARs and submachine guns and, and everything else. Uh, and he said, I, I'm going to have an awful time explaining where all these extra weapons came from. All I want you to do is get rid of them. I don't care what you do with them, get rid of them. So this M1 that I had picked out of the Rhine River, I had test fired it after I got back from that recon and I liked it better than the one that was issued to me so I turned in the one that was issued to me and I carried this one the rest of the time I was there. So when they told us to get rid of it, I just put it in a box and sent it home. And I still have it to this day. And uh, I, I forget where I was, some gun show I was at and I mentioned this to a, to an exhibitor there, and he says, you know, he said that, that M1 Garand is worth X number of dollars, but he said its value increases because of the story behind it. Mm -hmm. And he says, you ought to uh, make sure that you record the story behind that rifle. And uh, for in future, uh, that will add a lot more value and historical value to the to the rifle. Mm -hmm. And I have done that. I have written up my experiences from the day I went in until the day I was discharged. On, on, uh, I got out on February 7th in 1946. And uh, then two years later, I the position that I was working in I, I was an outdoor person. I, I could not stand working indoors. And by then I'd been married to my lovely bride of 59 years. And uh, we were expecting our first child. I was not happy with this. 
the job I had, I was a machinist apprentice at the General Electric Company in Schenectady. And that meant going to work eight hours a day, going to school for three hours at night, and then having two or three hours of homework on top of that. And uh, so I got to the point where I said, I'm going back in the Army. And she reluctantly agreed that that's what I wanted. So I enlisted in January of 1948. I had to take a, one drop in grade. I had been a technical sergeant. I had to take a drop back to staff sergeant. And uh, my first assignment, I, I enlisted in Schenectady, and I wanted to get back in the combat engineers. And the recruiter told me, he said, well, Sarge, he said, there's a program right here in Schenectady that you might be interested in. And at that time it was when the government was bringing uh, bodies back from World War II. Those uh, next of kin that wanted their, their uh, loved ones brought back, the government was bringing them back. And uh, they needed escorts to escort the bodies to the homes and remain for the funerals and that. And they said, we need some people at least of your rank, because the escort had to be equal or higher rank of the person that they were bringing home. The only trouble was that I, I liked it because I could have spent that year, uh, first year of my enlistment right there in my hometown. But I had to enlist regular army on a sign and then take my chances on getting back in the engineers when that program was over. And. I had to attend a few classes on military funerals and protocol and so on. And uh, after I took my first hero home for burial, when I came back, some of the guys would say, well, how was it, sorry? I said, that was pretty rough. Of course, I'm a sentimental sort of a person anyway. And they, oh, you'll get used to it. You'll get used to it. Well, in the year I was there, I took 25 heroes home. And uh, the bad, last one was just as bad as the first one, as far as I was concerned. It was my duty to stand at, uh, at I guard at the open house in the funeral. Uh, several times I had to be in the parade in some of these small communities. They would meet the train and uh, there'd be a parade uh, of veterans to the funeral home. I would be in that and I would have to make arrangements for the military funeral and fold the flag and make the presentation to the next of kin. That was always the tough part. But I met some wonderful people. Uh, a lot of times I, I would be put up by the funeral director and sometimes even by the families of the, the, the hero that I brought home. Uh, I was on per diem, so that was extra money in my pocket if I if I could uh, I could do that. But as I say, I met some wonderful people. In fact, the one funeral director, uh, he and his his mother ma uh, made some uh, little baby clothes for me while I was there to bring home to my to the to the baby, and uh, I I heard from a number of them after that. Uh, in fact, just a, a matter of a few years ago, I received a, a notification from a, a gentleman in California who was doing research on the death of his uncle, who had been killed in the Pacific. And he said, I, in paperwork that I had, there was a Sergeant Mole that had been escort, and I was wondering if you were any relation to him. And it so happened that I was the escort that had brought his uncle home. And I had all the paperwork and everything on it, and I sent it to him. And he was, he was just absolutely uh, uh, flabbergasted that he was able to contact the, the escort that brought his uncle home almost 60 years previous. And uh, I, on, on several occasions on my hometown in Scotia, there was one one fellow in particular that had been killed over there, and his family was 
were bringing him home and they requested that I be his escort because I had grown up with him and knew him personally. And the only trouble was that when that program ran out, I was I wanted to get back into combat engineers, so I, uh, there was a school opening up at Fort Belvoir for what they called a uh, combat construction foreman, and that's what I had been previously. So I put in for the school and was accepted. But uh, before I could go, I had to have been transferred to the 9th Infantry Division in Fort Dix, New Jersey, because by the time that six months of school was done, my unit would have been disbanded and I would have nothing to come back to. So I had to be transferred on paper to the 9th Infantry Division in Fort Dix. So I had to get down there first and get the paperwork and everything in order to go on to the school at Fort Belvoir, Virginia, which at that time was the engineer school for the country. So I graduated from that school at the head of my class. Uh, there was 30 of us and uh, from all over the country. And it was quite extensive, and the Army classified it as equivalent to a two-year college degree because of, uh, of all the subjects that we, we covered over that period of time. So when I got done, I was sent back to Fort Dix at the 9th Infantry Division, and I got there, and they said, well, sorry, go back and do what you were doing before. And I, said, I wasn't doing anything. I said, well, go back and do it again. You know, well, <laughs> This was right after, just a few years after the war, and the Army was in flux, I suppose, at the time. So I went down to the 15th uh, Engineer Combat Battalion, which at the time was assigned at Fort Dix to do mainly the post-engineer work, uh, maintaining the ranges and roads and so on. So I went down there and talked to the CO, and he says, yeah, I have a vacancy, sorry, I'll, I'll put it in and we'll get you transferred to my unit. So I got transferred down to there, and I was only there a short time when there came a, a high priority for my MOS, my Military Occupational Specialty number. Uh, they wanted them down in Fort Benning, Georgia. Well, there was two of us there that were graduated from that school. And he says, I really want to send the other one, but he's on leave right now and I can't locate him. And this is high priority, so he says, I hate to send you, but you're the one that's got to go down. So I got transferred down to the 78th Engineers in Fort Benning, Georgia. And uh, that's when we became the engineer troops for Fort Benning, which was the infantry center of the country and you might have heard that uh, they have these demonstrations down there because they conduct courses from for uh, officers from South America and whatnot and uh, periodically they have demonstrations because they don't feel that we should be training those officers and so on but uh, that's politics then I, <laughs> I don't like to get involved in that but uh, we were uh, the engineer troops for the school and whenever um, a bridge problem we would demonstrate how the bridges were built for these school troops and uh, we became the uh, that's when I specialized in explosives and demolitions and this one field problem that we had when they would have these demonstration troops walk through the field as like a field attack and we would set off these charges here and there through the field to simulate artillery and mortar fire coming in. And in this one problem they had all the students setting up on, on the bleachers on the, on the hill so they could overlook it. And we had 1200 charges that we had to plant down there and uh, they were all wired into a control panel. so. As the problem progressed, they could push buttons and set off these charges. And uh, on this one particular day, uh, we had a series of them that didn't go off when they were supposed to. Uh, after the problem, we always went down and we had to check every one of these 
it was a little pit about three foot deep with a little wire around it and this is where we had planted the charges. So we had to go down and take all the charges that didn't detonate and we'd take them all up and we'd place them in one place and detonate them all at one. So just one day we disconnected the battery off the control panel and we went down and started picking up the, the charges that hadn't detonated. When some lieutenant up there decided, well, what happened? Why didn't they go off? So he hooked up the battery again and started throwing switches. Just as I was picking one up out of the, by the lead wires, picking it out of the hole, it detonated. My glasses went flying and my helmet, and uh, luckily I didn't get injured, but I went up, and as a sergeant, I lit into that lieutenant, and uh, I thought, I'm going to get court-martial for this, but I, I went up in one side and down the other, and the captain stood there, and he said, Sergeant, are you through? I said, yes, sir. And he says, okay, you step aside, now I'll take over. And he let into it. But I got away with it, and from then on, we always disconnected the batteries and took them with us so that no one could do that. But uh, that's about when the Korean War broke out, and I was frozen for another year. I had a year left on my enlistment, and then I was frozen for another year. And Every morning when I left for work, uh, I'd kiss my wife goodbye, and not knowing whether I was going to see her again or not, because every morning about 10, 10.30 in the morning, they'd have a, a formation, they'd read a list of names, and by 1 o'clock they were on a plane for California and to, the, to Korea. And sometimes within weeks we would hear of some of them being killed in action over there. And I kind of sweated it out, and finally I got down. I had eight months left on my enlistment. And the company commander called me in. He said, Sergeant, he said, I've been authorized to form a new special oversized company of combat engineers. Instead of three, <coughs> three, uh, <coughs> three platoons, it's going to be a four platoon. And he says, I would like you to come as long as my platoon sergeant in the first platoon. He said, we have a special mission in Austria. He said, as long as you have six months left, you're eligible for Korea. But uh, he said, uh, I would like you to come if you would. So think it all. So I talked with my wife and I said, it's going to mean about eight months of separation because they had no dependent quarters over there yet. And uh, she said, if that's what you want, do it. So. I went with them in, in the special 518th Engineer Combat Company. And we had, we lived in Tent City for a while until they got barracks built for us. And at that time, as they say, the uh, four powers, France, Russia, Great Britain, and the United States were the occupiers of, of Austria. And uh, one of, our pro one of our jobs at the time was to, we had to photograph, measure, and diagram, and plot the number and placement of explosives for every bridge, every culvert, every mountain pass, uh, in case there was an invasion by Russia, uh, that we would on command, on withdrawals of all troops that were on command, we would have to blow these bridges, blow the mountain passes, and so on, as we retreated. And we would be out for days and days at a time on alerts when we didn't know whether it was real or, or a practice alert. We would have to go out and mine all these bridges and mine and get them all wired up and everything, and then they would call it off, and then we'd have to deactivate them all and go back. But there was another uh, part of that project that was top secret. And uh, it's funny that even afterwards when I, when I finally got out of the service, some of the experience I had gained there would qualify me for a promotion. That I was working for the Navy at the time at the Navy Depot in Scotia. And some of the experience I had there would have qualified me for promotion, but I, 
I couldn't use it because it was still classified. And it was only a matter of a few years ago, I happened to be reading the paper in the morning and I said, oh my God. And my wife said, what's the matter? I said, it's finally come out. And she said, what's that? And I said, what we were doing over in Austria so many years before. What it was, was at the time, we were burying arms and ammunition in strategic places all throughout Austria and sometimes even over in, across the border in some of the other uh, countries. Uh, these were plotted, and buried and plotted. Uh, the weapons were all uh, encased in cosmoline and so on and then in plastic and wrapped and buried. And the purpose behind it was in case the people were going to do any uprising, like they did the Hungarian uprising in 56, uh, that they would have weapons and ammunition in which to do it. Well, it seems like over the years, a lot of these records either were destroyed or buried or what, because the right hand didn't know what the left hand was doing until just a few years ago. Okay, we're rolling. Okay, now you were talking about uh, burying these caches of weapons. Uh, right, and as I say, they were encased in cosmoline and the ammunition uh, for, for all the weapons. and They were strategically buried in these different locations so that in case the people wanted to uprise against their communist uh, leaders, that they would have some weapons to use. And I don't know whatever happened to the records over the years, but all of a sudden one of those countries, I can't recall it right now, was doing some construction work and they dug up some of these caches of weapons and they didn't have any idea where they came from or why they were there. And it was in the newspaper and at that night it was on the national news and nobody seemed to know anything about it. And that's when I told her that that's what we had been doing. Up to that time, she had no idea what we were doing over there. She knew about the bridges and mining and whatnot, but she knew nothing <coughs> about the, the, the cache of weapons because that was top secret. It was only supposed to have been known by a very few people. And we were sworn to secrecy. So, uh, I, I was amazed, amazed that there was quite a to-do about it because nobody seemed to have any records of where these came from or when they were put there. <laughs> and I said to my wife, I said, I can tell them when and I can tell them where. But uh, it, um, I uh, was running down on my enlistment, it was getting down uh, I only had a matter of a few months left and I got a call from the Red Cross that they had a had a cable for me and uh, I was to go call a certain operator and I I went into town and, and went to the Red Cross and, and called home or called this operator, Red Cross operator and she said, oh I have a telegram for you. Well, what had happened was my wife's father had died, and she sent me a cable saying, Dad died today, and so and When the woman read the cable to me, it sounded like she said, Dave died today, and that was our son's name. And I was, please, say it again. And she kept saying it, saying it, and I spell it. And she said, D-A-D, and I said, oh. I was sorry to hear that her dad had died, but I was so relieved that it wasn't her mm -hmm. son. So I talked to the company commander and he said, Sarge, you're about to do it to go home anyway. He says, I'll arrange, I'll get you a flight where you can fly home. Uh, so I was getting packed up and ready to leave and uh, he called me and he said, Sarge, I hate to tell you, but I, you got bumped off by some colonel, so you'll have to wait and go back by ship. So. We sailed out 
in early December, I sailed for home. And it was one of the worst storms that they had had in the North Atlantic in a long time. Uh, the Queen Elizabeth was three days late getting into New York, so you can imagine this liberty ship that I was on. We were five days late. We would spend, for days, we were 24 knots in 24 hours. They were keeping just enough steerage into the storm. And, oh, it, I swore at that time I would never get on anything bigger than a rowboat if I, as long as I lived. But eventually we, we got through it, and how, I'll never know, but we came into New York Harbor on Christmas morning. And I called my wife at home and let her know that I was back there. And she came down with our son, and he didn't, didn't really know me, kind of shied away from me. It had been eight months. He was quite young yet. And that's when I decided that as much as I intended to make the Army my career, that that was a time when I should terminate it and go home and be a father. So that ended my military career. And I have not regretted it. I, I think one of the best things that ever happened to me was going into the Army when I did, because I grew up in one hell of a hurry. At one time I had I was 19 years old and a sergeant and I had two men in my squad that were 38 years old, old enough to be my father. And that's a lot of responsibility to dump on a young kid. But I think, I think it did me more good than it did harm. And I think most, most young fellows that went in during that time will admit that they had to grow up in a hurry. And we did. And <coughs> I can see now why sometimes they refer to the greatest generation. I think of it not only as, as the greatest generation of, of uh, military, but I think the people at home on the home front deserved as much credit as those that were on the battlefield because they, they went without a lot, they worked long hours producing the materials that the soldiers needed, and I think well, like down at the, uh, when we went down almost two years ago now to the dedication of the World War II Memorial, uh, I think that they should have saluted the, the home front as much as they did the, the military. And it was quite, quite inspiring when we were down there to be, you could walk along the street or be on the subway or anything and people would come up and say, I'd like to thank you for what you did. We were sitting in one of the tents where they were putting on like a USO show. And someone tapped me on the shoulder and I turned around. It was a, a district police officer on bicycle patrol. And he said, sir, I'd just like to shake your hand and say thank you. Uh, it was awesome. Uh, yeah, you know, and we were walking down the street. And my son-in-law was pushing my wife in the in the wheelchair. We wouldn't have been able to go without my daughter and son-in-law because they, they drove us around and they pushed her in the wheelchair. But we were pushing down the sidewalk and he said to me, he said, did you see that fellow just went by in the wheelchair? And I said, well, I saw him. Yes, why? And he said, well, he had a Medal of Honor. I said, you got to be kidding. I turned around and I ran back down the street and I stopped him. Sure enough, he had just the ribbon on his neck. And I said, that's the Medal of Honor? And he says, yeah. And the young man that was pushing him said, yes. That he had, apparently he was a Marine and he had earned it on uh, uh, Okinawa. And I said, well, you know, it's not every day that I get to shake the hand of a Medal of Honor winner. And it was, it was quite inspiring. And he was quite elderly, but we shook hands and we talked for quite a while. And it was really great. And speaking of Medal of Honor winners, I, during the Korean War, we had a neighbor. Our doors were more than, no more than about six inches apart. Our apartment here, his apartment here. He was a 1949 graduate of West Point, uh, 
Samuel S. Corson, and he was down there taking advanced infantry training. And he even took a 30-day leave and took parachute training while he was on 30-day leave. And he was, he would come over and he say, "Bud, sit down and talk to me for a while." He says, "Tell me some of the things you were in World War II. What what are some of the things that officers did that were real, you know, that were real?" They had a word for it, chicken, uh, but I won't go beyond that. But um, he would take notes, and uh, he wanted to be a good officer. Well, he got shipped off all of a sudden to Korea, and it was only a matter of a few months later. It went about 3 o'clock in the morning, we heard a commotion. My wife says to me, something's happened to Sam. And sure enough, Sam had been killed in action. And he had, had just given birth, and his wife had just given birth to a son who was only a couple months old. But anyway, uh, some time later, we were, the family had gone on a vacation trip, and we had crossed on the Staten Island Ferry, and as we pulled into the dock, a uh, military ferry pulled in alongside of us. And I looked up and I said to my dot, look, and here the name of the ferry was Lieutenant Samuel S. Corson. And come to find out that he had been awarded the Medal of Honor posthumously. Well, for the longest time I tried to find out the citation that went with that Medal of Honor. And I kept running into roadblocks or passing the buck, go, go try here, try there. Well, it was just a few years ago that I was down at our son's on Christmas and we were talking about it. And he said, Dad, let me see what I can find on the computer. Within five minutes, he was able to locate it and had it printed out, the whole citation. And it seems that he is, was, uh, he was killed on Columbus Day, 1951. And uh, some of his men had been wounded on a Chinese attack. And he had gone out to bring, he brought one back and was bringing the second one back when he was overrun by Chinese. And the last they saw him, he'd run out of ammunition and he was swinging his rifle like a, like a baseball bat. And the next day, when they recovered his body, there were seven dead Chinese soldiers laying around him. And I was able to locate his son Samuel L. S. Corson <coughs> Jr., who is presently Chief Executive Officer of National Cash Register. And he has his dad's Medal of Honor, and uh, it had been presented to him by Five Star General Omar Bradley. It was supposed to have been presented by uh, President Truman, but he was on uh, some overseas conference at the time, and General Omar Bradley, one of the few five-star generals, had presented him with that medal. And at that time is when we found out that he had been brought back and he was buried at West Point. So my wife and I drove down to West Point, and as we went into the administration building at the cemetery, we asked, you know, where, the location of Lieutenant Corson. And she started to look it up, and she said, wait a minute. That's a Medal of Honor winner, isn't it? And I said, yes, it is. She said, I know right where it is. She said, told us the role and where to go. And she said, now you'll notice when you get down there that his headstone will be all lettered in gold as a Medal of Honor winner. We, we went down, we found it, and we have some pictures of it. And what a shame. He would have made a fantastic officer. Did you, uh, after you had the service, did you ever make use of the GI Bill? Uh, in between World War II and when I went back in, I used a part of that for the apprentice course for just under a year. Uh, I was getting uh, a certain subsidy from the from the government. How about the 5220 Club? Yes, I was definitely in the 5220 <laughs> Club for not for too long. The, as I went to work in the meatpacking plant there in the village. But uh, there was a group of us that used to meet together about every evening in one of the gym mills in the village there. And 
we were all members of the 5220 Club. I'd almost forgotten about that until you mentioned it, yes. Did you join any veterans organizations? I did. I did. Uh, my mother and dad have been very active in American Legion from because my dad had served in World War One, mm -hmm. and uh, so I had belonged to that for a while. But then when I went back in the service again, I lost contact, and I, I never did really get back in any organization after mm -hmm. that. Uh, now you said you had stayed in contact with some men that served with you. Yes, uh, there was three of us in particular that. Uh, we were nicknamed the Three Musketeers because we were together all the time. And uh, I have several pictures of the three of us. And getting on the internet, I was able to locate one of them out in uh, Fort Atkinson, Wisconsin. And uh, we drove out and spent three or four days with he and his wife out there. Nice couple. And it's amazing how uh, our experiences uh, coincided because we both got married about the same time. He got called back during the Korean War and he was uh, promoted to a Master Sergeant. I had been promoted to Master Sergeant. And uh, our, our lives kind of paralleled each other and we had a tremendous time together. The other one I have been trying for years and I cannot locate him. I found people with the similar names. I've called them and, and none of them uh, are related. And that He and I were real close right after the war. Even we, we wrote back and forth and so on. But then getting married and raising families, we got mm -hmm. away from it. And, and I have no, no idea whatever happened to him. Mm -hmm. And quite by accident, while down at the uh, dedication of the World War II Memorial, that's where I was able to locate. I, I got a sheet where some disc jockey out in Ohio had interviewed a lot of veterans of World War II. And uh, once a week he would play that on his program out there. And there was a list of them, and if anyone wanted a copy of those tapes, you could write to him and he would send them to you. It was a slight charge. And going down through the list, I saw 1285th Engineer Combat Battalion. And, oh my gosh, I, I, you know, it was a small outfit, you know, mm -hmm. and, and there's not too, probably not too many of us left. So when I got back from there, I called this fellow, the DJ out there, and I, I told him, I said, you know, whoever it was that gave you that interview on that tape, I, I would love to get in touch with him because that was my unit. Mm -hmm. And he said, oh, great. He said, I'll tell you what I'll do. He said, I'll get in touch with him, give me your phone number, and I'll have him contact you. Well, it wasn't a half hour later and my phone rang and it was this, this gentleman. And as I say, he turned out to be, he was the first sergeant of A Company. He was promoted over there. He had been a staff sergeant. Their first sergeant got killed, and he was promoted, received a double promotion up to the first sergeant, and he was first sergeant of A Company. And we had a long talk. We'd been in touch with each other, and periodically called back and forth. And he's the one that, one of those that I, I mentioned this book about, that was written about the 1285th Engineer Combat Battalion. If you just hold it up like this. Yeah. Uh, okay. And, uh, my son-in-law is the one that found this book on the internet and he ordered it for me knowing that that was my unit. And when I got it, uh, I read it and it is, as far as I'm concerned, it's a complete book of fiction. Uh, none of the episodes in here are realistic. Uh, there are so many uh, so many um, mentions of, of fights and battles and whatnot that we were nowhere involved in. And uh, I, along with the invoice that came with it, the, the uh, publisher requested uh, that he said, I hope that your father-in-law enjoys this book and we'd like him to call and give us his comments. Well, since then, I have sent this book to 
my buddy in Wisconsin who was in the same company, H&S company, as this gentleman was. And I also, the first sergeant of A company, I told him about it. He ordered the book. And we all agree that it's just uh, a little embellishment can be tolerated, but this is just out and out fiction. And our main concern is that this book never be used as a, a historical reference because it's just, it does not represent what the 1285th Engineer Combat Unit went through. Now, if you want to hold this photograph up and tell us where and when that was taken. Well, this photo right here was one that I took from another photo, but uh, this was made in uh, Lincoln Park Servicemen's Center in Chicago when I was going to school there, and uh, we were right in, uh, we were living in the armory on South Wentworth Avenue, which was right across the street from Comiskey Ballpark. And downtown Loop of Chicago had a number of servicemen's clubs down there where you could go and get free passes to any entertainment, any theater, uh, uh, it was just uh, amazing. You could go get them anywhere from a snack to a full meal. You could go to any any uh, stage shows, theater. The servicemen's clubs were absolutely fantastic, and I made made good use of them. And that down at Lincoln Park Servicemen's Center, they would take pictures of you. And uh, there was even one here in in a book that I've got where they did a silhouette of me. Uh, I don't know whether that can be seen. Uh, now, who is that on the... You want to show us that picture? Is that your sister? I have a picture of my sister in here. Uh, about when was this taken? What year? That was uh, in November of 1943. Okay. Uh, I have this one section in here of my family, uh, a circuit of 1940s. My dad my mother, my sister in her kitchen. She was a mess sergeant in London. Uh, my brother Charlie, who was wounded, and he was home on recuperation leave at this time. His arm is still in the cast. Myself and my younger kid brother, who was five years younger than I am down at the bottom here. And then when I was home on leave, my mom, dad, my brother and myself there, but this this was my whole family at the time, and this is myself in basic training, <laughs> brand new raw recruits. But this is uh, this is a silhouette that was done at the uh, servicemen center in Chicago at the time too, and we have I have some pictures in here of uh, the bridges that we built. Uh, yeah, this is the Jerome Bridge, uh, which was later named Triumph, and uh, I've got some little, probably a little bit better pictures here. Well, this is a, uh, the cathedral in Noose, uh, almost destroyed. Uh, these are the Cologne Cathedral. These two pictures of the utter destruction around it, but the cathedral itself was relatively undamaged. And this is a close-up view of it. Uh, uh, this is some newspaper reports of my sister and I being able to get together over in, in Europe. And... Uh, here are some pictures of the bridge that we built. Uh, here again is uh, the Triumph Bridge that was renamed the Triumph Bridge. And uh, uh, well, this, this is some right after the war. This is our unit history that is uh, uh, the 
you can take it out of here, but it, it's from the day it was activated until the day it was deactivated. And, uh, and this is just a, a voyage certificate of coming back on the USS Breckenridge. And these are some of the, the ribbons and that. And, uh, and the little piece that just fell out here, quite by accident recently going through some things in my mother's, I came across some Christmas cards that I had sent to her in 1943 and another one in 1944 from Camp Housie, Texas. Oh, those are really nice. And uh, I was surprised to know that she had kept them all these years. Mm -hmm. So I thought I would just stick them in the back of the book here. So I, I didn't mean to bring them with me no, today. That's no, fine. Okay, well, thank you very much for your interview. Yeah.